power, and I don't give a shit, I'm going to start anyway. What do you guys want to learn today? You showed up early, saved your seats, you get first dibs. What do you want? The color game? You guys want to learn the color game? How does that file into people reading for fun and profit? That's pretty interesting. David. Chinese face reading stuff? Yeah. John. Cold reading. Cold reading. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. People reading for approaching. People reading for approaching. Ooh. Anything else? Cold reading. Cold reading? Okay. I want to learn why David Snyder workshops are so popular. <laughs> I have no fucking clue. I heard he's a dick. <laughs> I'll know by the end. Chinese face reading? Chinese face reading? How about... D, all of the above. Because yeah! they're not mutually exclusive. Not mutually exclusive. We have about four minutes if anybody needs to use the potty. When would now be a good time to do that? <laughs> There's no. <laughs> do we need more chairs? Yeah. Let's go ahead and grab more chairs. Steal them from somebody else. All right. There's one up front. There's one or two interspersed here and there. Don't be bashful. I love, I'll tell you right up front. I love questions and hate time limits. There's a reason I host and, and promote all of my own events. Because no motherfucker can hold up a sign saying, get the fuck off the stage. Right? So. And I borrow one that chair for myself. What if I say no, bitch? <laughs> uh, martial artist would be okay. Of course you can. Go ahead. All right. For those of you who are interested in all the things we're talking about, I will show you my quick and dirty approach to cold reading, which is actually quite simple. It's called the 60-40 split. All right. But what we're going to do is we're going to use Chinese face reading as a way, as our pace. See, the thing about cold reading, especially if you do it the way I do it, which is not the way most mentalists teach it that I know of, okay? If you understand face reading, your cold readings are no longer cold. They're actually true. But if you phrase them in a certain way, even if you're off, you're not off. You understand? Now, the, the tactically, everything I do, even though it's, everything has to, I do has to be fun or I won't fucking do it. Right? But one of the things that we need to understand is that everything I do is designed around a couple of key principles. A, least amount of investment, greatest amount of return. I don't waste time on low percentage technique. Does that make sense? I don't have time to waste in my life, and I'm pretty sure you don't either. Would that be true? If you guys want to get the most, for the most for the least, just raise your hand. That being said, the more you invest, the more you're going to get. I tell all my students, whether, and I consider you my students, whether this is your first time meeting me or you've been a long time YouTube fan or whatever, for everything you get from me, you'll always pay twice. You'll always pay twice. The first payment's the easy one, that's the one everybody makes, that's just the money. You can always make more money, you can always get more money. And the first payment gives you access to the information. But it's the second payment, is the hard payment. It's the second payment of time, of energy, of effort to invest and practice and put these skills to work by playing with them out in the field that gives you ownership. Once you make that payment, you have a power and a skill that no human being on the planet can take away from you. No force in the universe can take away. It's yours forever. And it will continue to serve you for as long as you continue to use it. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's have as much fun as humanly possible because the more fun and playful you are, the more powerful you become. That is science, all right? Uh, a, a, a statistic I reported last year, actually, from a video I posted on one of my blogs was actually from the field of hostage negotiation where they showed that even in the most tense, hostile of situations, hostage negotiation, being fun-loving and an upbeat and playful resulted in a 31% increase in the successful negotiations. 
okay? The more playful you become, the more power you wield, the more access to resources that you have. That being said, I think I open loop myself on this thing. The thing about Chinese face reading is that it's all true, more often than not. In this class, we don't have time for the exceptions to the rule. Does that make sense? So those of you who sort by exception, stop. <laughs> we don't have time for that right now. For everything I tell you, there will be an exception somewhere. But what I'm teaching you is true at least 51 to 75% of the time. And if you word it properly, even when you're off, you're not off. Okay? Those of you, how many people here see clients? Okay? You want to gain power and leverage in somebody's world really, really quick, tell them things about themselves nobody can know. Okay? That's what this will do for you. Now, the book I'm using is written by my teacher, the, fa the famous Lillian Pearl Bridges. You can get this on Amazon. Uh, you can also get a Kindle version. I have permission to use her materials. I have permission to basically do anything I want with it as long as I tell people where I got it. That's a Chinese tradition. You always honor your lineage. You always honor your teacher. And uh, if, if you know anything about me, I'm big on telling you where I got my stuff. Right? I take credit for the synthesis, not the source. Yes, Dick. Sorry, Lillian Pearl Bridges. If you want to go to her website, it's lotusinstitute.com. I'm going through her master, cert, or her master face reading program. And uh, I'll be graduating sometime in, hopefully, December. And then I'll be doing even more in-depth studies. But Lillian is so good at this, she's the world's most prolific and famous face read, uh, expert in face reading. And she can look at you and tell you your Myers-Briggs profile. She has at least two three-letter agencies from two separate countries who are trying to get her to work with them to help spot potentially violent uh, criminals and terrorists. She's not sure that she wants to do that, though, because she's afraid it'll be misused. Her father was ex-CIA, so it's kind of a family tradition, if you know what I mean. But um, the, only pro the only thing we may or may not have time for is the color game, because you all came to learn how to read faces, right? But... The thing about Chinese face reading, and one of the things that separates it from just basic cold reading, besides the fact that there's 5,000 years of Chinese observational science behind it, um, is that it's actually a form of Chinese vibrational psychotherapy. When you do face reading, you get in a dialogue with, a, with, a, with your, your uh, subject or your, your client, and what you'll literally see is, and, and I didn't believe this when Lillian told me this, but when you actually, they take before and after pictures just to prove it. As you go through the different wrinkles on the face, every time you have an emotional trauma, there's a wrinkle that appears somewhere on the face. When you start unpacking that trauma, the wrinkle goes away. And so on the last day of the face reading, she does it in five, uh, five, day, or five day blocks. On the last day, she brings in people off the street, we just do, and the students do face readings. And the first thing they do is they have them stand in front of a white background, they take a before picture, and then the students go and they do the face reading, they come back, they take an after picture, and then after all the models go home, they put them up on the screen and you compare, and they're different people. Foreheads get higher, noses get longer, ch chins fill out, colors change, wrinkles, just, it's fucking weird. But then the world according to David is a pretty weird place anyway, so, yes sir. How does Botox figure into that? It freezes your liver. Botox, I'll get that question a lot. Botox, most can get it up in here. This is the liver spleen area anyway. And so it actually reverse engineers and it, it, it limits your ability to express emotion, not just vi visually, but actually in terms of your expression. Um, and liver energy, which is seen in the eyebrows, by the way, is about your action taking energy. So if you get people who, who have a lot of frozen energy up in here, or a lot of wrinkles up in this way, there's some blockages to their ability to take action in the world. Sometimes that goes to boundaries. Uh, sometimes that goes to them holding themselves back in a lot of different ways. Okay? In fact, we're going to talk about that. I'm gonna, first piece I'm going to do is about learning how to uh, read people from a distance. So those of you who are interested in the approaching aspect of it, uh, the relationship side of things, that's where we're going to start, and then I'll move through that as quickly as we can, ask, we can assimilate the information, and then we'll move into the face reading component, and then we'll show you how to kind of talk to people in a cold reading type of a format. Okay? And one of the reasons I like cold reading, tactically, is because the, in the world according to David, you have what I call the four horsemen, this is a more poetic way of saying it, the four horsemen of unstoppable hypnotic power.
Those four are A, authority, attractivity, affinity, acquiescence. If you can get any two of these, you automatically generate this one. But there is a small portion of the population who just likes to do what they're told. There's a, 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 a attractivity. Attractivity is not, uh, is, is the ability to manage the power of attraction. It's the ability to generate attraction and manage it in other people and yourself. The ugly truth about attraction, my friends, is that attractive people get more stuff. A, a very famous dating coach named David D'Angelo used to say, attraction is not a choice. In other words, you don't get a choice into who you're attracted to. However, in the world, according to David, there is a correlate to this. You do have tremendous influence over who you choose to attract, who you choose to generate attraction in, and that's what the field of attractivity is about. You see, each of these, each of these generates its own kind of compliance, and that is the business that we are in, ladies and gentlemen. If you're a hypnotist of any kind, if you're a human being who interacts with human beings of any other kind, your job is not belief. Your job is compliance. Your job is to get people to do what you want them to do the way you want them to do it. Yes? Affinity. Affinity is kind of like everybody in this room. You're here for a certain reason because you have something in common, right? You want to be part of the crowd, part of the herd. Anything that goes to rapport, anything that goes to sameness or liking is an affinity tactic. Each of these will generate compliance, but differently. They'll have different dynamics to it. The more of these categories, and these are macro categories. These are not just a technique. These are a body of techniques. Okay? Uh, in, my, in my course, Killer Influence, is the manual, can TJ or Tina, can you hold up the Killer Influence manual so they can see just how extensive that sucker is? It's been known to, it's in the wagon back there. Killer Influence manual? Actually, the, the, iron, the ironic thing about the title, Killer Influence, just hold that up. Hold this sideways so can see how thick it is. Those are just bullet points. It's my textbook, right? Um, so when you come to my Killer Influence trainings, that's what you're learning from, okay? It's, it's, and everything in there is field tested. I can't even tell you, because of confidentiality clauses and stuff like that, how extensive that material has been field tested. Some of what you're learning is in that manual. A lot of it, in fact, except for the Chinese face reading, which I learned later. Okay? But authority will generate compliance even if they don't want to follow your instructions. Okay? A guy by the name of Stanley Milgram proved this several decades ago. Darren Brown redid the experiment where he convinced people to administer pretty much lethal shocks to somebody who was pretending to be stuck in a chair because somebody in a white lab coat and a clipboard told them to. The more perception of authority you have in somebody's world, the more rapidly the neurology can feel, feels compelled to comply. Now, this is not something you have conscious control over much. It is a reptilian response. In other words, your paleocortex, the most powerful, oldest part of your brain, is very sensitized to social status and authority. Okay? When you start cold reading, you start stimulating authority in a pleasurable way in the minds of your listeners, in the minds of your subjects. It's a very, very, and they become hyper-suggestible to you. Isn't that what we want? We want the people we interact with to be as suggestible as humanly possible so we can create the greatest amount of change. If you want somebody to open up to you, tell them things about themselves their best friends don't even know, and the floodgates open. If you do this in combination with a technique I've been teaching you all week, how many people have been to my other two breakouts? Raise your hands. How many people have been to my other two breakouts? Raise your hands. Okay. So when I say echo technique, you know what the hell I'm talking about. If, <laughs> if, <laughs> Just small stuff. Oh, I taught you well, Stadion. I taught you well. All right. So authority is where we, when we start to play cold reading, that's the first trigger that we activate. If we do it within the context of echoing, it gets even stronger. Okay. This is starting, to, this, I taught you things throughout the course of the week, one piece at a time, in, in, it, in isolation. The real power, as powerful as these individual pieces are, 
when you start stacking them and you start nesting them in each other, now you've got something that's greater than the sum of the parts. It's massive, okay? So authority is useful when you're doing face reading. People are going to open up. You've got to have good rapport, okay? But this will generate rapport because all of a sudden you'll, they'll either run screaming in terror, in which case, start over, <laughs> or they will just tell, oh, he really understands or she really understands, and they'll open up. And then you can echo and you can feed. The more you echo somebody's own words back to them, no matter how small or in-depth they give you, the more it primes their neurology to give you more information. Okay? I can't stress, this is not reflective listening. Okay? This is echo exactly their words. The most powerful words a human being can hear are the ones that just came out of their mouth. You get that? Tattoo that inside your underwear, backwards inside your eyelids, so every time you sleep at night, you get reinforced. It shouldn't be this powerful. Something this simple should not be this powerful, but like most things I've discovered that have the real power in life, it is. It truly is. So authority is where we start. Now what happens is now we start to generate attractivity. We start to generate a feeling of, oh, this person understands me. They get me. They validate me. You see, authority triggers compliance, but it also engenders pushback. If somebody just, t if, you're, if you have an asshole boss, anybody here ever have an asshole boss? I have one. I work for myself. <laughs> right? And I know, I can tell you firsthand, he's a dick and an asshole all at the same time. Okay? Sometimes he never leaves the house for that reason, but that's a different issue, especially if you're in San Francisco. But anyway. I, oh, I didn't give you my disclaimer. If politically incorrect language, swear words, colorful metaphors, or the word boobies offend you, there's the fucking door. <laughs> this means I know the answer. This means I don't. This means, oh shit, I hope he doesn't call on me next. This means yes. This means no, there will be a test. This is a body language class after all. <laughs> right? um, but I want to go through this. Even though this wasn't part of the actual curriculum, this is where you would use these things. This is where you would use these things. Attractivity generates a desire to comply from a desire to please. A desire for validation, a desire for a little pat on the head or an attaboy that says, oh, you're, you did good. Somebody's goodwill. Authority triggers compliance because you have to. It's more of a fear-based, do-it-or-else kind of an energy. Right? You got, if, you get, if you just work off of an authority-based influence paradigm, which you'll see in like um, some military leaders, some corporate leaders, have a very do this or you're fucking fired kind of an energy. When you take on the trappings of authority, you may, how many people have had an, uh, an altercation or an interaction with a police officer where you had something that they were questioning, right? You do what the hell they tell you, right? Because they have the symbols of authority. You may not like it, right? But you do it, don't you? And what do you do as soon as they're out of sight? <laughs> Because I would never do that a lot, right? Did you miss the test? Attract, authority generates compliance, but you will not get somebody's best efforts. You will get some form of passive, uh, aggressive behavior, some kind of pushback. I call it the fuck you factor, okay? If you soften authority within attractivity, so think of the king being authority. The queen is attractivity. People will do what you say out of a desire to please, a desire for validation, a desire to be liked. Does that make sense? They want your approval in some way, and so you'll get more of somebody's better efforts. Does that make sense? Now, as hypnotic operators, or as I like to call you, hypnotic operatives, your job is compliance. So you need to, ma if you really want to be, as far as I'm concerned, if you want to be effective in your work, these are the areas of technique that you need to master. The more areas of this you can bring to bear in any situation, the more power you're going to wield. You'll get situations where people will want to, they'll feel the urge to comply, and they'll want to comply because they want to please you. Remember, the unconscious mind is a slave to, to feedback. It wants to please. So feed that need, right? Give the rewards, but make it want to please you, and you're going to do really, really well. I have a waiting list in my clinic. I have a clinic in Solana Beach. I've been running for 12 years where um, my, my specialty is treating physiological illness that has as its roots repressed emotion. Okay, so some people specialize in smoke cessation. Some people specialize in weight loss. I get like three a year. 
Okay, I, I get Parkinson's, cancer, multiple sclerosis, scoliosis, chronic pain, acute pain, every medical condition, post-traumatic stress, rape trauma, you name it, that's what comes to hysterical paralysis, convert, you know, I would say com conversion disorder, that's the stuff that I get on a daily basis. And I have to go in with high, you know, I can't waste time on speculative technique. This cooks the rice. Because in order to get in to see me, you have to pass my screening. Understand? If you ever see me post, you'll hear me say, we offer all prospective clients a free 30-minute uh, 30 30 consultation to determine if your case is a fit for our methods. After you pass our evaluation, we'll discuss strategies and tactics for getting you the, the results you need in the shortest amount of time possible. That's literally what we say. So I'm not asking you to be my client. I want you to prove to me that you're good enough to be my client. I have a waiting list through October. Okay? You don't have time to fight with people to change. Especially if you're doing a flat rate procession. Okay? You need to prime people before they walk into your door to be compliant to you. Because none of the good you, don't, you know, none of the techniques you bring to bear happens until the client does what you say. Okay? Belief is nice. It's, belief is only partial of the equation. It doesn't matter what your clients believe. It matters a lot what you believe. You understand the difference? What matters is how willing your client is to comply with your directives. And that's what everything I do is about. I'm not saying we just be an asshole or be, you know, you know, all fascist, although sometimes that can be fun. That's a different class for a different day, right? But that's what we want. Affinity. Affinity is the desire to be liked or be part of the group, to be accepted by the group, okay? They have done studies where they've taken people, they, they put one person who is the test subject in a room full of people and they're asked to evaluate um, like the lengths of lines and things like that. And one person says it's this, and the rest of the group says it's something else, and within a few minutes that person changes their, their opinion, even though they were right. That's affinity tactic. The power of the group. Okay? Heard of mob mentality? Mob mentality is actually a vibrational phenomenon. Okay? How many people here have ever heard of heartmath.org? Okay, if you haven't, go to their website. They have some great studies on what they call coherence. Coherence is based on a physics law of entrainment. Rhythmic sources seek to find a common rhythm. The strongest rhythmic source in your body is the human heart. The human heart radiates an electromagnetic field eight feet in diameter from your body that can be measured with instruments. Is there any human being in this room not sitting within eight feet of another human being? Now, they, took, they, they did this one test where they took a dog and his boy and sent them out to play. And within 15 minutes, their heartbeats synchronized. So suggestion, as we understand it, doesn't play a role in this phenomenon. It can't not happen. So when people's heartbeats start to synchronize, pretty soon the rest of their physiology starts to follow, as do their thought processes. Understand? Okay? So affinity works on that level. It's the desire to be part of the group, to be accepted by the group. And that is also a reptilian-based, a paleocortical response. Extract or um, excommunication from the group is equivalent to extinction from the point of the paleocortex, the reptile brain. Human beings are driven to seek status within a social group because the reptile inside of each of you knows society protects its high status members. Right? You know, every, you ever hear about these these uh, these native tribes out in like. The, the Pacific, like Tahiti and all these places, or Joe versus, you ever see Joe versus the Volcano? You guys remember that old movie? Yeah. Right? When it comes time to, to, uh, to give a sacrifice to appease the volcano god, who do they throw in? The chief? The shaman? Or the cute virgin? It's because the cute virgins are a renewable resource. <laughs> Took you a minute. Some tribes, some, some cultures have this concept called king for a day, which actually is a translation to mean sucker. Right? If it's time to make the sacrifice, they nominate some poor schmuck to be king for a day. They let him drink, eat, be merry, give the pretense of making decisions. And at the end of the day, whoo, into the fire he goes. And the old king goes, ah, that's a good guy. Anyway, thank you very much. Right? <laughs> Society protects its high, his high status members. Your job 
is to hit them on all four cylinders as much as you can. Demonstrate authority. Demonstrate you're like them. Demonstrate, uh, generate some form of attractiveness in you. And you will find out that people will just do what you say. And they'll like you for it. Uh, you know, I, told, I, show, I, had, I had Tina hold up the Killer Influence Manual. All titles aside, the, the whole idea behind Killer Influence is to move through the world making everyone around you feel ridiculously good. To like being around you. And they'll just give you stuff. They'll show up in mass to your trainings. <laughs> They'll hug you for no reason. They'll seek you out, right? If this is something you want, keep coming to class because this is what we teach you, right? Okay, so that's the four. And, and if you generate any two of these, really, you'll get this. But there's a small group that will just do what you say anyway. They just want to be told what to do, right? But don't move, don't rely on that. Stack the odds in your favor. The things we're going to do are based on something that we teach in Killer Influence called the I3 model. I'm going to share this with you real quick. Then we're going to get into the rapport continuum, posture power, and then we'll talk about face reading and how to build in these face reading ideas, or these cold reading ideas, into a face reading format. And then depending on how much time we have left, if any, um, we'll let you play with it a little bit. Now, I gotta be honest with you. If this is the scope of everything that I wanna share with you, I have time for this. I mean, like this. So here's my promise to you. As I say in all of my classes, I will take you as far as I can. I will give you as much information as humanly possible in the time that we have. And I will tell you where to go for more if that's what you want. Would that be fair? Okay. Now, some of you know that I've been doing something very, very special at each of my breakouts. How many people know what that is? Raise your hands. Okay, for those of you who don't, how many people here have been hearing, <laughs> hearing them raffle off those $2,700 packages of, or the $7,000 packages of stuff? Well, we're going to give away one of those today. <laughs> but in order for me to give, give it away, I need you to do something for me. I need you to take out a piece of paper, not a huge piece of paper. I need you to print legibly. I need your name, address, phone number. Or not, not name, name and email address and phone number. Fill it out, move it to the end of the room, and Tina's going to come around and uh, pick that up for you. Okay? I, won't, I can't talk about it when the cameras are running, so. Um, but, um, okay, so everybody pass that stuff in? Okay, so please remind me if I forget. Is there anybody on after me, or is there doing, is there doing any kind of events after? Okay, so here's my promise. I am going to officially end us at the appropriate time. If for some reason you guys man, want to keep hanging out and talk and maybe learn some other stuff, I might be convinced to do that. Maybe. <clears throat> Judging by the round of applauses I get and interactions and, you know, how much body engagement I get. All right, very cool. Like I said, when I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't spend a lot of time hanging out with hypnotists. I love y'all, I really do, but most of the people I talk to can't even spell hypnosis. Right? So I spend a lot of time talking and teaching people who don't know anything about what we're doing, don't know anything about our industry, or have a head full of bad ideas about our industry, how to do stuff, how to get forward in life. And I think that when I, because I've spent so much time there, that it helps me to get these things out to you a little, a little easier. We've got to have fun. We've got to be playful. I can't stress that enough. I've started the last two classes with this whole idea of state control. The largest, most powerful component to your subconscious mind, which is supposed to be our domain. The domain of the unconscious mind is the realm of the hypnotist. And yet, as a, as a profession, we leave the largest piece of the unconscious mind untouched. It's your body. Your body is the biggest piece of your unconscious mind. And when you bring the body back into what we do, your changes happen faster, they're deeper, and it doesn't matter what your fucking clients believe. It doesn't matter how much critical faculty is involved. The longer you get the meat engaged, the faster it overwrites their conscious critical faculty. If we, that's the case, if that's a truism, and it is in my world, if you don't agree with anything I say, or with certain things I don't say, don't use them. Okay? But I'm telling you right now, you've got to get your meat involved. Okay? So to that effect, everybody stand up. <laughs> give me, TJ, give me two minutes on the timer. 
You guys wanted to play the color game? You got it, motherfuckers. How many people here have ever heard of a, a uh, phenomenon known as power poses or Amy Cuddy? Anybody raise your hands if you got that. All right, Amy talked about four basic postures that she evaluated scientifically. She discovered that if you hold these poses, and by the way, these are not the only poses that work. These are just the ones she tested. I've been teaching this stuff since 2005, and what we do in our state control modules is head and shoulders above what we're about to do, but it's good enough. I want you to remember a time in your life when you saw something you really wanted, and I mean really wanted. On a scale of zero to 10, it was a lust factor 20, right? And you made a decision in that moment that you were going to get it no matter what. And you made a plan, you worked that plan, and maybe you had to modify the plan along the way, but you still kept going and you nailed it. Home run. Remember that moment when you knew you nailed it. See what you saw, hear what you heard, feel what you felt, smell and taste what you smell and you taste. And let them hands go up in a victory posture or put your hands on your hips like Wonder Woman. Step into that moment. Stand the way you were standing in that moment of victory. Let those feelings come flooding back. And as you do, notice that there's a place in your body where those feelings start, where they grow and where they spread from. Now, without taking your hands down, just become aware of that spot and look at it with your inner eyes. Notice there's a color, maybe even a series of colors connected to that feeling. What's that color or series of colors? First impression. Now imagine, a, use your imagination, you can close your eyes if you like. Imagine a big ball of that colored energy floating above your head. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change as with every breath you take and every beat of your heart, that big ball of energy begins to grow, begins to expand, to fill the room from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall and all points in between. Notice how it wraps itself around you like an amazing blanket of unstoppable drive to thrive, to succeed no matter what. Breathe it through your entire body. Let it fill you up like water fills up a bottle, like fluid fills up a test tube, like hot air or helium fills up a balloon. Anchored in so fully, so completely, no force in the universe can turn it off, not even you. And when you know you've got it, try to turn that shit off and notice what happens instead. Oh shit, you mean you're stuck feeling good now? <laughs> Open your eyes, notice how good you feel, keep your hands up till the timer goes off. Are we feeling funky now? <laughs> funky, baby, right? It's a long ass two minutes. <laughs> I think I'm being time distorted. We good? TJ, where are we at, brother? Five, four, three, two, Yeah! Big round of applause. All right. Now, before you sit down, before you sit down, while I have your asses up, all right, we got one more thing we're going to do. I'm going to teach you how to be bulletproof. Is that okay? Emotionally, anyway. After you master this drill, no one's going to be able to push your buttons ever again for very long. Is that okay? Remember this. For every psycho-emotional state you have, you have a corresponding breathing pattern and physiology that you have to assume in order to activate and maintain that state. Positive or negative doesn't make a difference. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just summon up all that awesome success stuff you got right now. Go back into that posture. You don't have to hold your hands up. Just the, the way you were standing when you, when you nailed it, okay? Just, you know, if you were to hide your shoulders back, whatever it was. That's what I want. Now, I want you to keep your posture and your breathing exactly the same. Don't change anything. And I want you to summon up all of your willpower and try to feel bad. Uh-oh. What, you mean you can't feel bad? Oh, shit. That's right. No pun intended, right? Okay, bring the good feelings back. Turn around, look at that far wall. Now, we're going to do a similar drill. You can have these good feelings back in just a minute. I want you to remember a time in your life when you saw something you wanted. And you just, again, lust factor 20. You made a plan. You put that plan into operation. But it didn't work out. For some reason, you missed the, the brass ring. I want you to remember how you felt in that moment when you realized you weren't gonna, it wasn't going to happen, the disappointment, whatever it was. Gonna, and I want you to go into that posture. Stand the way you were standing. Breathe the way you were breathing. Let those feelings, just for a moment, come back. 
Now, keeping this posture, keeping this breathing pattern, keep these the same, summon up all of your will, and try to feel good. You may notice it doesn't work all that well, right? Now, hold on to the negative feeling with your willpower, but shift your body back to the positive physiology and breathing pattern and notice what happens. You can put your arms up if you want. It's extra credit. What do you notice, ladies? Turn, up, turn around, look back up here. What do you notice? You mean you, you, you couldn't fucking follow instructions? I told you to keep feeling bad, bitches. Recalcitrant motherfuckers? All right. That's what I'm saying. Your environment, give yourself a big round of applause. It's good. All right. Here's the thing. No matter what situation or context we're in, if we can't control our state, if we can't exert effect and manage our psycho-emotional state, it doesn't matter what skills we have. It doesn't matter how much training we have. If we can't get into a state that allows us to access those resources, we might as well not know them. I'm a martial artist. I have a ninth degree black belt in the martial arts. I have several other black belts. Uh, I have more energy healing credentials than McDonald's sells hamburgers. Okay, I've been doing uh, Reiki since before Reiki was cool. I've been studying Kabbalah since before Madonna came along. So I'm very much a prima donna, <laughs> which is true on a number of levels. Right? I'm also a certified, licensed acupuncturist and master practitioner in oriental medicine. I have a diplomate of oriental medicine. In addition to my clinic, I teach persuasion and influence all over the world. And I didn't do any of it for you. <laughs> I did all of it because there were things in my life that I wanted. There were things in my life, there were systems I was being taught that were going to be only a certain level, and, did, and then they would stop, and I'd have to find another, another workaround. So everything I'm here to share with you, I did for me. And I found out, lo and behold, there's a whole community out here who wants it too. So here I am. So thank you for that, for giving me the chance. What we're, thank you. What we're going to cover today is from the Killer Influence Manual. The first thing we talk about is what we call the I3 model. To be effective as an influencer in any situation, you need three, comp three key areas that you have to understand. Identity, in intelligence, and influence. Now, most people, when they come to my classes, they're primarily focused on influence. They want to learn the tools and the techniques to influence other human beings. But to use a martial metaphor or a military metaphor, the most powerful, destructive, effective army in the world can do nothing if they don't know where to drop the bombs. And that is the study of intelligence, the ability to acquire and utilize information about your target, the environment, and the context in which you'll be operating. And that is what we're here to study today. Okay? The more you know about your target, the less effort you have to exert to influence them. You understand that? So we're going to start with distance work. And what I mean by distance work is being able to look at a group and determine several things. Who's the rapport leader? Who's more invested in the relationship? Who's getting ready to leave? Right? So to do that, we need to talk about something called the rapport continuum. Okay? I may bring people up here to do this. I'll see if I can demonstrate it on the board. Actually, I'll do both. It's faster if I demonstrate it on the board. If you think about now, a lot of this information I gleaned from the world of attraction and seduction, from the LA Six seduction community. I, I come from that community, okay? I won't, I won't lie to you, because some of the most powerful techniques I've had for healing people came from that world. Because the one thing you can always rely on is the creativity of a horny male. <laughs> we will do just about anything to get our agenda, right? Ironically, ladies, the most powerful things we in that community learned about how to attract women were the shit you was doing to us. That's right. All we had to do was echo what you were doing and you fell right in step. Because each and every human being on this planet is moving through the world with a little checklist. A checklist that tells us exactly how the world's supposed to be by our standards. And we're projecting 
that checklist onto everyone around us looking for a match. And if you know how to pay attention, which if you summed up everything in this, in this first segment of this training to two words, it would be that, pay attention. The first course I ever wrote was a multimedia course. It was called Secret Orgasm Tips. It was a course, yes, it was a course that taught men how to be any woman's ideal lover the first time they were together before they even made love. And it was all about and this, uh, paying attention to their ideal lover template. Now, as we go through this, when I do give conversational examples, here's what I want you to do. It's natural when, you're, when I'm doing these examples for you to want to watch me. I get that. But what I want you to do, if I'm talking to somebody in the audience, I will very rarely bring somebody up into a conversational demo in front, because when I bring people up, they go into demo subject mode. They start acting on their best behavior and they start acting the way they expect, I want, they expect I want them to react. I would much rather interact with you in the audience because I get a much more organic response. When I start doing these things, when I start talking with somebody, don't watch me. Watch the person I'm talking to. Pay attention to their responses. Gentlemen, here's your first opportunity. Ladies, let me ask you a question. If you met a guy... At the moment, within moments of meeting him, it's like he knew you, it's like he was reading your mind. It's like he knew exactly the words you wanted to hear. He knew exactly how to touch you the way you've always fantasized about being touched. He even knew how to kiss you the way you fantasize a perfect kiss should be. And when. Like it's like his timing was exact. He knew exactly when you were ready and no, no sooner. And he could take you places as if he could just read that fantasy that you've always carried around in your heart. If you met a guy like that, what would you not do for him? Gentlemen, look at their faces. <laughs> Lesson. <laughs> you see? You can't ask the question without them to go, starting to go there. Yes? NLPpower.com forward slash products. <laughs> there is a lot more to that system. That's where the system started. Okay, that's chapter one. Just giving you an idea, okay? Um, but it's really the concept we have been reading and hearing about for decades. People are always projecting who they are outward. Every, this latest studies in neuroplasticity are telling us, I think in Sean Carson's book, uh, I, think he, I think he quote either, he, he, I, may, I, may mangle, I may mangle this quote in a minute, but he said, every nerve in your body is trying to connect to every other nerve. Okay? Well, every molecule in your body is trying to interact with every other molecule too. As above, so below. Why do you think we're all here? Why we're all looking to connect with each other? It's called the law of analogy. Because you, your behaviors follow the same pattern as your cells. You're seeking connection. And your neurology is moving through the world looking for itself. And it's sending out little pings like a radar. Looking for the things that match, that come back. And when it gets a match, it cleaves to it. It holds on to it. And it doesn't want to let it go. That's why when I say the most important words a human being can hear are the ones that just came out of their mouth, I am not kidding. You have a practically infinite number of filters in your experience that culminate in the words that come out of your mouth to express yourself. Well, guess what? The words that pass through every filter have been approved by every filter. Therefore, when they come back, they go right in. Right to the deepest level of that neurology. They can't ignore you even if they wanted to. That's trance. Get it? And it doesn't matter if it's a verbal thing or a nonverbal thing. We're all projecting holographically on every level. Okay? If we get to the part on gestures, you'll see that even more clearly. So the first thing we want to talk about is rapport con uh, the rapport continuum. I believe that the archetype of all social interaction goes to the mating archetype. In other words, one plus one equals three, if you know what I mean. Right? It's a mating ritual. 
right? So if we look at the rapport continuum, is two ways, okay? This is zero rapport. This is maximum rapport. Uh, zero rapport, maximum rapport. As this gap is closed, two things, there's three things I want you to start to pay attention to in this process. A, proximity and uh, ventral orientation. And thirdly, you can look at their feet. Uh, ventral orient, in fact, let me just bring a person up here. Shauna, can I use you, sweetie? And uh, let me use somebody who is uh, extraordinarily manly. Edward, come here. You manly motherfucker, you. All right. So just to give you an idea, OK? This is the traditional mating paradigm. You guys don't mind mating for a few minutes, do you? OK, good. I have permission. It's OK. They're consenting. She is beautiful. I, I can't argue with that. All right, so first and foremost, if we look at the outliers, see one of the things I want, I'm not, this is not a course, a full course on every conceivable body language cue out there. It's a bare bones course that allows you to understand the outliers so you can extrapolate what's going on very, very quickly. Does that make sense? So let's start with zero rapport, none, indifference. I call it going from indifference to intimacy. In an indifferent, interaction or relationship, this is what you get. Turn your face this wall over here. That's good. This is almost antithetical rapport over here. These people who are, have no affinity moving away from each other. That's the outlier. Right? This is anti-rapport. Get it? Now, as we move towards intimacy, one plus one equals three, the mating paradigm two things begin to change. First, ventral orientation. The ventral line, like a compass needle, begins to shift. Now we're neutral. We may be walking side by side, but we're not necessarily very intimate. Does that make sense? But as things happen, and I started really far out here so it was easy to see. As people start to change, this happens. This happens. And then, and again, I'm making it very much larger than you would see in real life. A little bit closer. A little bit closer. Until finally, the prox at first proximity will shift, then ventral orientation will shift, then proximity will shift. So until eventually we have this. Now, in my, uh, if you want to see one of the, the big paradigm, in, uh, there's a video I have on YouTube called uh, body The Mating Dance, Body Language Decoded, which there are seven discrete stages that two people go through on their way from stranger to intimacy. Okay? It's, it starts with what we call the acknowledgement stage. Now, you'll recognize, now, that may be a little bit abstract for you, but I'm going to do something in a minute that will make this dramatically more clear. This is something you will commonly see here in Las Vegas, mostly in the bars. Let's assume that Shauna is sitting at the bar. Does this look familiar? Now, here's the thing we need to understand. What has now happened is he's at the boundary of her, her uh, social zone, basically. Okay? This would be bordering on her intimate zone. What will happen in a mating context, and this will actually happen in a networking context as well, is as he enters the, her periphery, just right, that's good. What you'll see is a, just a slight turn. That's called the acknowledgement phase. That's her saying, oh, there's somebody in my world who wants to come in. Now, one of several things can happen at this point. This is something I want you to start playing with. This is called the unconscious hello. This is your first body language influence tactic. Whenever it's called a key, it's a key stimulus. Whenever two mammals meet, especially primates, the first thing that happens is the minute they make eye contact, they get an eyebrow flash. Okay, you guys have been flashing your eyebrows to me all day long. Okay? And what, now in guys, you'll see it, it's a, in, when guys do it together, it looks a little different. Women are much more subtle. They're way smarter than we are. Okay? You, you see two guys doing the flash at each other, it looks like two Goombas on the New Jersey Borough going, hey, how you doing? The whole head gets involved. 
right? <laughs> Women, it's like little flashes, right? And what you want to do is as the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the first two seconds that you make eye contact, and that's even if you're, and that's still a little slow. It's got to be in the first second. When you make eye contact and you flash that eyebrow, there you go. See, she just did it, <laughs> right? That, that, that return of the eyebrow flash is like a ping from the sonar. It signals friend. They fall into rapport. Okay, that's a tactic that was developed or at least discovered by a guy named Dave Dobson. Some of you may know who he was. A lot of you know who Milton Erickson was, but a lot of you don't know who Dave Dobson was. Dave Dobson was the other hypnosis guy that Bandler and Grinder modeled. Okay? It was just that Dobson was a hell of a lot more reclusive. Okay? So that unconscious eyebrow flash is a great way to break the ice instantly. Now, I, I have a story about when I was in Israel, and I really tested this at the Dome of the Rock. Don't, don't be an asshole. <laughs> I'll tell you about that some other time. Okay, but give these people a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I could go through the seven stages and we'd, we'd be talking about that all night. There is a lot more stuff buried in the seven stages. See, the one thing you need to understand, and I'll, I'll just give you this concept. I'll let you discover how it works later. For every psycho-emotional state that you have, there is a corresponding physiology and breathing pattern, posture, that activates it. Most of us know that when we go into a certain emotional state, we take on a certain posture. But the reverse is also true. You proved that, didn't you? If you go back and you watch the videos of me teaching the mating dance, and you pay attention, what you will see is even though I'm doing a demo, even though the woman who is helping me knows it's a demo, she still starts to become more and more attracted to me as she moves through each of the seven postures. <laughs> just an idea remember your physiology controls your psychology with almost no exceptions unless you are a special forces athlete or a special forces like soldier an elite athlete someone who's trained to keep their willpower strong like, a, like an endurance runner or, or something like, and even that to some degree your willpower is the fastest thing to drain because it, it any, at any time it's a finite resource your environment can overwhelm you. It can amplify your level of neurological arousal to the point where you can't function anymore and you can't summon up enough willpower to modulate that stress. But you can always change your physiology. Unless somebody physically ties you up, you can always change your physiology and it takes the minimum amount of willpower to keep a posture for at least two minutes. Right? And that's what allows you to break that state and become functional again. I need to cover that over and over and over again because if you don't have this, nothing else is going to matter. It's not going to matter what you know. You ain't going to be able to observe shit because you're going to get tunnel vision. Your butt's going to pucker up and your brains are going to drop out. <laughs> okay? We need to control our state first. And once you really plumb the depths of state control, you don't need just about anything else. 80% of your, your influence is done before you open your mouth. But this is the first thing we want to look at. We want to look at the rapport continuum because the proximity people have and the ventral orientation tells us who's the prize. See, the more we value something, the more we orient towards it. So in this example with Shauna and Edward, Shauna was the prize in that interaction. So Shauna had a lot less investment than Edward did. You see that? Don't believe me, go watch human beings in their natural environment. Okay? The other thing you want to look at is feet. Feet, footwork, neutral, this is a neutral position. This is kind of in. I know you can't, it's hard to see. That's why I wasn't going to do feet today. This is, this is kind of in. This is all in. Can you use your hand? Yeah, so this is neutral. This is part in, part neutral. This is all in. This is part out. Now, you'll see this a lot when people don't really want to talk to you. Like, they'll be like, Hi, how you doing? This is kind of where I'm at. This is my feet right now, right? Now, in the pickup and seduction world, they, were actually, they would actually adopt this posture because it was what they called a false time constraint. They would go up and say, hey, I only have a few minutes, and they would have the whole conversation like this, and her defenses would go down because she's expecting you to leave. 20 minutes later, you're still there, but you're still holding this posture, <laughs> right? So... 
Again, never, never underestimate the creativity of a horny, observant, intelligent male. <laughs> All right? Or female, for that matter. Okay? Uh, when I, who was here for my speed attraction workshop? On, uh, right? That protocol was developed by women to be used on men. So, ladies, you ain't fooling me. You're just as devious as the rest of us. <laughs> right? But it is, in fact, the most ethical, honest decent way to communicate with a person. That's what I love about it. There's no deception, there's no confabulation, there's nothing going on there. But I want you to understand, when you look at a group, the feet and the ventral orientation will tell you who the rapport leader is. When you want to influence a group, the hardest thing to do is try to influence one person at a time. That's, that's stupid. See, I teach jury. I teach uh, about 35 personal injury attorneys. I consult them on trials and how to win cases and things like that. And I teach them how to do things in jury selection. We win the case while they're selecting the jury before the case even goes to trial. And one of the ways that you do that is you make every bad juror a good juror. Because one of the things that happens in personal injury cases, and especially in voir dire, is you have to eliminate people, which is why a lot of times lawyers get the, uh, the code name for being an asshole, or a shark, or a snake, or whatever, is because their job is, is not to be nice. But when you incorporate this stuff in, the jury starts to look at you as part of the tribe. And remember, societies protect their high status members. So when the tribe vouches for you, the tribe stands behind you. Does that make sense? So the hard way to get a uh, rapport with a jury is to get each individual member. But if you find out who the rapport leaders are in those groups, who is everybody looking at? Where, are their, where is their ventral orientation? And then you match the physiology of that person. Now, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens. I don't know that we'll have time to play with it today, but there's this thing that goes along with the idea of coherence. Remember we talked about heartbeat, heartbeat synchronizing and stuff? There's an interesting click that happens. Uh, when you mirror, some, mirror somebody's physiology, there's a kinesthetic shift that happens in the body that lets you know the proprioceptive nervous system has synchronized with somebody else's. When that moment happens, any emotion or feeling you generate within your own body, their mirror neurons will pick it up and mirror it in them as well. It may or may not be within their realm of conscious awareness because there are firewalls between the different levels of the nervous system. But what will happen is it will subtly prime the person's neurology and perceptual filters to perceive your communication, the verbal communication, in a way that is conducive and in harmony with the message you want them to accept. How many people here have ever heard of a show called Lie to Me? Raise your hand. Okay. Love that show. Watch every season. Buy the DVDs. The consultant for that show was a man named Dr. Paul Ekman. Now, they did take some liberties in the show, which Ekman had a problem with because he's a scientist. He wants everything to be accurate. But by and large, the vast majority of that information is factual. You can rely on it. In his book, Emotions Revealed, Dr. Ekman isolated a behavior known as the emotional refractory period. The emotional refractory period is a filter that, that modulates and manages the, pri what your, the priority of attention that you have. Priority of attention that you have. So if you go into an environment in a bad mood, see, where's my, let's see here. Let's say there's 10 units of information in your environment. Five of them are positive, five of them are negative. If you're in a good mood, guess which five you'll pay attention to first? That. If you're in a bad mood, guess which ones you'll pay attention to first? In our influence classes, we teach you using postural matching and physiology and coherence how to tap into somebody's nervous system in a tangible, testable way, generate an emotion in you, and have their body pick it up and act on it. Okay? So that's how we kind of work with judges in hostile juries and things like that. Okay? So the first and foremost is um, understanding this. When you look at ventral orientation and posture, this is where we start to work. The closer people get, the more intimate they're becoming. Okay? Questions on that? Yes? What was the name of the show? Fly to me. Please. No. <laughs> Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because usually the head will be a subtle head movement as well. Right? Now, interestingly, actually I found time for that, but um, so this is what I call speed reading relationships. 
Now, the interesting thing is, if you go out to like a wine bar, or someplace that's relatively quiet where people just sit together, and I have a client, uh, a student that actually owned a wine bar, and I was, I was teaching them this, and, and she goes, oh my God, you are so right. This has to go to the seven stages. She goes, I would watch people come into my wine bar on first dates, and then when they go to sit down, they would be sitting on opposite ends of the booth. By the end of the night, when they were leaving, their wine glasses were right next to each other. Right? So this process happens. Now, gentlemen, I will tell you right now, the ladies will be initiating nine out of ten steps. There's only seven, but nine out of ten is the ladies. <laughs> right? Your job is to pay attention. Because there are certain key moments in that mating dance when you actually have to do something. And if you miss it, you go back down the arousal scale. Listen to them, guys! You guys realize that 60% of all approaches are initiated by women, right? This is the guys, ladies. Huh? No, you only have the illusion of control. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, really. The problem is, this is turning into an attraction workshop really quick, holy shit. All right. The problem is, is that women's psychology has developed a much more refined set of social cues and sensitivities than men's. Men were very simple. See it? We either, we're either going to eat it, we're going to kill it, or we're going to take it home and make babies with it. That's it. We're pretty simple. <laughs> right? Women are sending out signals all the time that they want you to come and talk to them. Women do not approach, per se. They engineer opportunities for you to approach. You hear it, gentlemen? They're trying to suppress it. They engineer opportunities for you to approach, but like us, they're victims of their own projection. You see, they believe because their signs are obvious to other women that it's obvious to us. <laughs> ladies, do you hear this? Yes. Let me give you a little bit of perspective, ladies. You can have a beautiful woman walk up to a guy and do this. <laughs> and he'll go, Wonder what she meant by that. <laughs> We're just not that smart. You're operating on a completely different set of social cues. You guys want the same thing, you just use different languages to talk about it. You just use different languages to talk about it. The most subtle signs for a man are some of the most blatant and sometimes threatening for women. Because the signals they're sending out are out here. We don't perceive anything until it's right here. So when we go to approach a woman, and by the way, most of your socialization, ladies, has designed all the good ones to keep from approaching you. In case you didn't know that. Oh, yes. <laughs> most people's socialization has programmed you guys and gals to send out signals that will keep the good ones from approaching you and only the sociopaths, narcissists, and pickup artists will make the leap. Yes? Huh? What sense does it have to do with neurophysiology then? To neurophysiology? What was the idea that we're sending out signals and we're, we respond to them that human beings respond, have a certain grammar? Mm -hmm. why, why would we send out opposites? It's not, it's not neurophysiology, it's social programming. <sighs> Hollywood. One of the problems, again, this is going way off in a squirrel chasing mode, but uh, one of the problems that we have is that we have been programmed, to, A, first of all, to play hard to get. Guys, you guys were all taught this, right? Play hard to get, have value, show scarcity. The problem is, is that the, the, the social cues you're designing, the body language that you've been taught to use to stimulate or signal hard to get actually says don't approach. And so what happens is the guys who are waiting, who are looking for invitations that you're approachable, won't. The ones who will respect your boundaries and actually be upstanding guys who are, will want to help and, and be the good mates you're looking for, they won't approach you without a tremendous amount of encouragement. Because the cues you're sending out, tell them not to. So who will? People with no ability to read social cues. Narcissists. People who don't care about your boundaries. Okay, now I know there's exceptions to every rule. 
The problem we have is if you want to, if, ladies, if you want to signal hard to get in a way that makes people want to chase you, be seen in the company of a lot of people vying for your time. Be seen as being, having your time in demand as opposed to being off in a corner. Because ironically, ironically, the body language of um, shyness can often be misinterpreted as the body language for aloofness to somebody who's extremely attractive. The, the body language of shyness, when people are shy or, or um, in a timid place, they tend to make themselves small. Alpha people, dominant people, take up vertical, horizontal space, they take up vertical space. This is the body language of charisma. Okay? In uh, Speed Attraction uh, 2.0, I showed you the, heart, the open heart trust trigger, right? where you literally can go from being just the average dude to radiating energy like that. Right? It's, and this was designed by women. This is a, the way it works is you imagine there's a plexiglass screen over your heart and you just want to show people your heart when you talk to them. As opposed to this. Feel the difference? Right? All I'm doing is imagining there's a screen here and I'm beaming my heart energy to them. I'm letting them see my heart. Changes my posture and it changes the level of credibility that I radiate to an audience. Okay? When you are shy, and this is true for guys as well, when you start going through being timid or, or unafraid, and afraid, what happens is you tend to make yourself smaller. You, you close in on yourself. You create boundaries. Now, when people see this, you may be just waiting for somebody to come and talk to you because you don't want to make the first move, but that's not how you're interpreted. It's not how you're interpreted, especially if you're attractive. If you're putting this out and nobody's approaching you, the first thing they do is they don't have a story. You haven't told them why you're doing what you're doing, so they create a story. They create a story about why you don't want to be approached. She must be a snob. She's obviously attractive, so she should have got, she must be a bitch. Sorry, that's, that's what happens, right? I don't make the rules, I just exploit them. I mean, report them. <laughs> right. However, if you, want to, if you want to invert that equation, A, change your body language. The problem that we have, and somebody asked about approaching, so I'll just answer this question. The problem both genders have with approaching is different. Women don't have a problem with you approaching, as a rule. They have a problem with getting you to leave. <laughs> because we're not that smart. You can be, you can be the, the one guy in a group of women and at some instant moment, every woman knows the conversation is over and they disappear. <laughs> and all of a sudden the guy's like, fuck, I'm alone. <laughs> right? We didn't catch it. Why? Because when your neurology was evolving, you were communicating with each other. You were cooperating. You were developing relationships and interpreting what behaviors mean in your world. We're out killing mastodons. We look at it. Do we eat it? Do we take it home and mate with it? Or run away from it? That was, that's how we think, right? We developed a different set of scanning mechanisms. Women's neurology evolved because they had to survive. They had to learn how to manage, you idiots, <laughs> right? Keep you around, keep you interested, and they had to learn to rely on each other. They had to learn very quickly in that unit who they could rely on, who they couldn't, and they had to do it based on the meanings they could extrapolate from your behaviors. So if we look at this from a hypnotic language perspective, men work men work in cause and effect We see it, we hit it. We see it, we chase it. We see it, it sees us, we run from it, right? Cause and effect. Women work mostly, and both sides do it, but there's a predominance. Equivalence. We left the toilet lid seat up because we forgot. Okay? We missed Jack's soccer game because traffic was a bitch. There was, two, there was a traffic jam, the boss kept us late, there was a tough client. That's why I was late. 
for Jack's soccer game. And your wife looks at you and says, if you loved your son, you'd have been there. <laughs> Why? Because being at the soccer game means you love your son. This is where 80% of our problems in communication with our, other, with our gender partners lie. Ladies, we're not as complex as you are. Okay, when we leave the toilet lid seat up, it's because we're freaking idiots and we forgot. It's not that we have no respect for the feminine gender and the home you've built together. Okay. You see, guys? Guys are like, huh? It's a language thing. But remember, ladies, your brains are actually more developed than ours. Your corpus callosum, the bridge between your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere, is almost twice our size. You see, size matters. <laughs> right? Men only process language on one side of their brain. Women use both. We're half-wits. <laughs> I love guys. I, I'm, I, I, I'm an equal opportunity hater, so, you know. But it's easier for you as women to understand us sometimes than it is for us to understand you. Gentlemen, if all you got out of today was remember that every behavior that you generate means something to them. Think about that before you do anything. <laughs> Just stop for a moment and ask, my, ask yourself, how is she going to interpret that? <laughs> and then think again. All right? I have a, I have a whole, whole workshops that I do back in San Diego where it's just about romance and attraction and relationships. And for me, I, it's, and it's co-ed audiences, and mostly women, believe it or not. And it's, to me, it's high comedy when I explain what the, the behaviors and the activities of the opposite gender are being interpreted by them. It's like terror on each other's faces. But this is the problem. Most women go to female dating coaches to bitch about men. Most guys go to male dating coaches to complain about women. Get in the same room and understand each other. Seek first to understand. You both want the same thing, just in a different order. You really do. You use slightly different words to describe it, and there's a slightly different syntax, but it's the same thing. Here's something, ladies, you didn't know. We're more sensitive than you are. Did you know that? You see, from the Chinese medical perspective, men are yang on the outside. We're strong and manly, tough like bull. <laughs> and we're fucking cotton candy on the inside. We can't handle vulnerability like you can. It hurts us worse. We don't bounce back as fast. So for a man to give you the intimacy and the vulnerability you're looking for, that's a big deal. But that's what you're looking for. That's what you're looking for. Men fall in love faster. Did you know that? Women fall out of love faster. Did you know that? <laughs> right? You get over us real fucking quick. Right? It's just how you... Again, 5,000 years of Chinese medical observation. And this is why you guys have the ladies. That's why you have the babies. You can take it. We can't. Right? So intestinally, internally, you're stronger than we are. So factor that in. Um, that's about, have we covered this kind of stuff pretty well? Another thing I want, to, I want you to pay attention to is when you're in close to somebody, and this is going to go into face reading, when you're um, paying attention to their eyes, prolonged eye contact generates attraction. Okay, not creepy eye contact. Right? That's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? When we talk about eye contact, we're talking about positive eye contact. So, po yes, ma'am. Well, I just want to go back to that example of the woman sitting like this. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Purely scientific reasons. Uh -huh. You do that for purely scientific reasons? No, I want to know how to undo that. Well, how to do that? No, how to undo, how to undo it? it? Yeah. Well, first of all, remember that whether you're male or female, confident people take up space. So expand yourself horizontally. That doesn't mean you stand like this. That's a guy thing, right? But when you, if you do cross your legs, don't cross your legs real in tight. Does that make sense? So good posture. Uh, I like to call it the Maryland switch. The open heart trust trigger is a really good uh, way to, to sit. Imagine there's a plexiglass screen here. 
and you're just beaming and letting people see your heart. If, that, if you just imagine that, your body, language, your, 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 body would, your posture would take over the rest. Okay? The next part is make positive eye contact. Positive eye contact, again, is not the serial killer stare. All right? And, it's, and there's always a smile with it. But the difference is there has to be a, uh, a, a wrinkles at the zygomatic. Okay, when we get to the face reading part, you'll actually see the long-term effects of this. The eyes have to crinkle. You see the crinkling? Right? If you see someone who's dead from the nose down, <laughs> not good. Okay? This, is, this is like the, the Donald, the, the, uh, the, what's the Trump's wife's name? Melania. That's the Melania Trump smile. Right? That's not what we're doing. Positive eye contact has to be good shen in the eyes, which means a, a twinkle or wide open eyes, not you know, scared eyes, but nice open eyes, smile with the wrinkles up by the sides of the head. That signals positive eye contact. When you enter a venue, and this could be male or female, and I, I practice this all the time when I'm walking through the, the convention, as you walk through a venue, meet people's eyes and look at who gives you positive eye contact. Right? Positive eye contact. That means you make eye contact with someone and you see this, not this. <laughs> right? Those are the people who are open to being approached. If you're doing walk up or street hypnosis, that's one of the first things you look for. Positive eye contact. Next thing you do, give them an eyebrow flash. Ah, he closed a loop. Holy shit. Positive eye contact, eyebrow flash, smile. Combine that with a good posture and an open heart trust trigger, you get a lot more people coming up to you. Okay? Very good way. If you want to be signaled as having, being high value in somebody's world, be seen in the company of a lot of men or other people fighting for your attention, wanting your attention. That signals status. And guys, that's what ladies look at. If there's a big crowd around you, there must be a reason. Providers are not handing out $100 bills or something. Right? right? This is this called social proof. It's an affinity tactic. Okay? We look at the responses of the people around us to determine what's appropriate. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else on this? This went a little bit of a different direction than I planned, but yeah. Why did you say to be seen in the company of men? What well, what I actually said was in the company of men or women all vying for your attention. We want, remember, we, remember in college there was always the popular crowd. They always had everybody wanting their attention, wanting their validation, things like that. Learn how to be those people. If you want to play the hard to get game, if you want to play the scarcity game, okay? If you don't have a tribe, if you're not part of a tribe, build your own. Build your own. That's what I teach my students. Go build your tribe. Let me show, I'll show you how to do it. Just build your tribe, right? But that's going to help you be more influential and charismatic. You're going to generate an affinity tactic. More people are going to flock to you because they see other people flocking to you. Okay? Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. You ready for the next piece? Do we need a break? Okay. This next piece I love because I geek out on this shit. Oh, shit. All right. Now, these, mo these characteristics should not be confused with micro-expressions. Uh, TJ, in the, in the camcorder bag is a, a laser pointer. Can you hand me that, please? Where's the, camco the little camcorder bag? Should be a laser pointer in there. Thank you. All right. This is in Lillian's book. If you guys need to take a picture, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with the upper right-hand corner, right at the eye, since we're talking about eye contact, okay? These, are the, these wrinkles are the end results of a lifetime of micro-expressions, okay? This comes from 5,000-year-old tradition of Chinese face reading. We're going to start off with, right here, this is probably the best one, and look to the people to the right and to the left of you, and notice they have little lines over the ribs, tracing the ribs of their eyebrows. These are people who are highly skeptical. Highly skeptical. Right? 
right here. They're all just rushing to the front of the room, right? And I'm going to let you guys do... Now, here's the thing. When you start seeing these, and you have a whole room full of people to play with, right? What you do is you, you pre-frame this. If you're going to use this in a cold reading format, you might say something like, you know, sometimes you spend a lot of time just really, really kind of on the skeptical side. You don't always take people for what they say until you've tested it to be sure. But sometimes you, understand, you immediately know you can trust somebody, right? That's called what I call the 60-40 split. 60% of the time you're this way, the rest of the time you're that way. Regardless of which end of the equation they buy into, the minute, it's called a Barnum statement, by the way. The minute they buy into that, they start assuming everything you say is true. It's a hypnotic process. But this is, this is actually true. These, people who have these lines spend a lot of time checking facts. They're not going to believe what you say at face, take what you say at face value. You have got to spend a lot of time creating more, more belief in what's going on. Okay? The next one we just talked about, those little wrinkles around the eyes right here, this is joy. You see somebody who's got really nice, solid lines, this is somebody who spends a lot of time laughing, a lot of time happy, okay? The corollary to that right here is sadness. I see a lot of that. Your clients will see a lot of that. These lines, they'll, they'll go right to about the cheekbone. The cheekbone is the line of demarcation where we go from sadness to sorrow. If the line extends beyond the orbital bone, now you've got someone who's gone through some loss that is still haunting them. Okay? These are your clients. These are your clients. Okay? If the line extends further down, Now you've got grief. When it goes this deep, now you're going to often see this line on people with lung problems too. Grief goes to the lungs. The entire series of organs is mirrored on the face. Each organ has an element or an, an emotion connected to it from Chinese medicine. Sadness is episodic. We go through it and we move on. Sadness lingers and then when we try to and this is what happens. This is why your grief patients will be your grief patients, is because they've created a conscious expectation of how long they're allowed to be sad. And when they exceed that length of time, they try to forget about it, they try to distract themselves, they try to stuff it down, and boom, down it goes. And if it stays there long enough, it starts to affect their lungs. Yeah? Is it typically on both sides of the face? But, uh, and again, I don't know how much time we'll get into this, but you can actually divide, there's... You can, you can divide the face this way, this way, and this way. When we divide it this way, we have a core. How many people do handwriting analysis? For those of you who do handwriting analysis, the three zones of the head correspond to the three zones in your handwriting. Metaphysical, mundane, physical. Okay? I have, I have that in the notes. I'm planning on going over it. Because that goes to how they make decisions. So if you're in a business context, and you can look at the, where people are dominant in the shape of their head. You can know how to present information to them in a way that's more conducive to them deciding the way you want to. Yes? How do you read the face of a teen or someone who's even younger who doesn't really have it? You don't. Oh, that's what I was told. Try not to read their face until they're in their 20s. Um, but there are certain things that you can look at. Head shape, for one. But people, children are still developing. So my teacher says she avoids trying to read children. Okay. Um, but a lot of times, if they're suffering from, um, again, I don't know how metaphysical you guys are, but I have, you know, I've actually had cases of genetic memory uh, in, my, in my clinic. I've literally had transplant patients who wind up having cravings from the donor organs. Like I had a, I had a lady who came in, she was a type 1 diabetic, wound up having a spleen and a kidney transplant, and two weeks after she got out, she started craving pizza and beer because the donor was a garbage gut, right? <laughs> So I have actual experience of seeing genetically transferred memory or cellular memory. So I think when we're, when we're dealing with children below a certain age, what we're dealing a lot of times is genetic memory. Okay? Which, what the Chinese tell us is that if you fix something here, it goes back seven generations and forward seven generations. Now it gets a little too woo-woo for this training. 
I want stuff that we can just rely on. Okay, I was working with one lady yesterday. As a matter of fact, you uh, in the blue shirt, your, your friend was with you. And remember, I, I said you have some unshed tears. You asked me if this was if this was just cold reading or not, right? And I told you that, and then you told me that you had a, uh, lost a family member, right? This shit's real, okay? And it's useful for you guys because when you look at somebody and you understand this map, this is a tiny piece of a very large iceberg which is why I gave you Lillian's information. Just tell her I sent you, okay? You can know what's going on. And what will happen is if you actually address the cause of those wrinkles, the wrinkle will go away. And it can go away in a session. It's funky. I didn't believe it. I have skeptical ones. Right? <laughs> so, but this you're going to see. You're going to see grief in a lot of your lung and asthma issues, a lot of your stuttering issues. A lot of um, anger is mostly TMJ and in the jaw. But that is, I keep pressing the wrong button. So this is important for us to understand, okay? One I see a lot in this room, and I see it a lot everywhere, but I'm seeing it more and more in the people in this room. I'm going to jump to the center here. You see these lines here that say disempowerment? The, I call these passive, or placation lines. This represents somebody who was, grew up in an environment or isn't an environment where they voiced their opinion or they expressed something and the pushback was so strong that they're trying to make up for it. They're kind of like, they're trying to fake smile. It's like they're always smiling but they really don't mean it, they just want to placate you. This is cancer waiting to happen. Okay? You know, I've seen people that look like somebody took an exacto and just drilled that energy. It starts from the outer, the inner canthus, and it radiates outward. Okay? When you see those lines, that's somebody who's spending way too much time to please other people because they're afraid of the pushback. Afraid of the pushback. Okay? Another one that's big, I see a lot, big in this room. Go back to the center line. You see these three lines here? When you see two lines like this, I'm sorry, I need a Vanna here, right? You see two lines like this, this is somebody who's impatient. <laughs> somebody who's impatient. Get to the fucking point, David, right? Get to the fucking point, right? There's another cor a body language correlate to this, okay? This person spends a lot of time being angry because things just aren't happening fast enough. Okay, hold on a second. Where'd my racer go? I don't see it. On the tray? I knew that. All right. So here's another one. I see a lot of this one in the room, so I want you to pay attention to it, okay? This is called suspended needle. There's three versions of this. Suspended needle, suspended sword, and then there's every now and then I see a version I call the suspended bazooka. This area in your body corresponds to your liver and your spleen. Liver energy has everything to do with righteous indignation, taking action, moving forward, expressing your power. People who have this marketing, we'll, call, we'll start with suspended needle, which is just a very fine line. People who have this at one point in their life, at some time in their life, usually towards the father or the, the dominant parent in their family, they express their anger. And the pushback from the dominant parent, usually the father, was so strong that they, they, they pulled back their energy and they refused to ever express it that way again. The bigger that energy, the bigger that line, the deeper that repression goes. And at some point in their life, that block is going to activate and they're going to stop moving forward. They're going to stop moving forward in their life. Okay? So when you see this, if it's, even if it's on yourself, don't worry, it's not going to kill you. Right? But it is, it, it is indicative of you're not expressing your full power. The liver energy is the energy that moves us forward in life. It's the success energy. Right? It determines how far we go. Your metal energy determines how you do it. Right? I, like, I like to make a joke. Wood people get things done. Metal people get things finished. Right? It's like, if anybody's ever seen my old websites, 
You can always tell a David Snyder website or a David Snyder email by the amount of typos in it. Because <laughs> I'm a wood person. I get shit done. Right? Contrast that to my wife, who gets things finished. I'm crossing the finish line. Half my, half my car is trailing behind me. She hasn't left the starting line yet, because she's still planning. Right? Both people, it's not one more effective than the other. It's a question of how they get things done. Does that make sense? We don't have time to go into the elemental personalities, which is all cool. But this, I think, for you guys, will give you the biggest bang for your buck. It will give you lots of things for cold reading, but it will give you a way to diagnose and start your questioning and intake process. Yes? You know, because we were talking about the eyebrows, I'm curious, what about the one that's horizontal? You don't see it very often. No, you don't. If you do, what does that mean? They're more factual-based. More fact-based. Um, I can actually let you look at the book. There's like a whole bunch of different things on eyebrows, right? Okay. Uh, and this is the textbook, by the way. Yes? So for this one here with the liver energy about going forward, since that's such a common one, is, is there, you said that at some point it's just going to stop as if it's a matter of fact, like there's nothing they can do to this circumvent it. that? Yeah, you can deal with the issue, which people in this room are uniquely qualified to do. But you're going to get people who say, I'm here to learn how to make more money. I'm here how to manifest stuff. Look right there. Right? If there's, if there's a, a, and there's always memory shit involved. But this is going to tell us how bad. And, you, and it'll give us a direction to look. Now, I don't like to use that to pre, um, predispose my line of questioning. But what I do do is I go through my normal neutral intake process and see how often that, that matches up. That matches up quite a bit. That and Louise Hay stuff is real good. So if you see double lines, you're seeing somebody who is very, has a tendency towards impatience. What? Impatience, right? They're always in a hurry. Get it done, get it done, get it done. If you see three lines, you're looking at somebody who's learned how to manage their anger. Who's learned how to manage their anger, okay? I see. I want, yes, sweetie. Does it matter which, which position that single line is in? No, as long as there's three there. No, when there, you're just going back to when there's one line, mm -hmm. down the center, does it matter if it's left or right either? No, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter, although it will give you a def, uh, it, will, it will tend to ind indicate whether it's on the parental side or the, uh, on the father side or the mother side. Okay. Chinese face reading divides sides by parents. Okay, but again, there's, there's a lot of ton, a ton of stuff here, and I'd like to get through at least most of the facial traits that you might be dealing with. Okay, but I wanted to, I wanted to zero in on this one because I see it a lot. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really for, focused on, on helping you target the things that hold you back from moving forward because I see that a lot in our profession. We all spend a lot of time on training and coming to conventions, but when we get out in the world and we actually go to build our business, we don't. And I see, this, I see these, these kinds of markers as kind of the reason why. This one says that I'm, I'm only allowed to, be a certain, to express myself and my power to a certain degree, and then it's too much. Usually this happens early in life where like, somebody pushed you on the playground and you beat the living snot out of them, and you got punished worse for protecting yourself than the person did for attacking you. Or maybe you and your dad had an altercation in your teens, because that's when we rebel. Right? Or if your mom was the more dominant parent and you rebelled against her and there was a huge push, she kicked you out of the house or threw you down, and now you have that guilt and that regret and you just choke back that power. Right? That's what will cause these lines to appear. Get rid of those lines, life changes. Okay? Question? I'm about to see it. You can't see it? Right here. Okay. Um, another one that you want to take special care of, you'll see this a lot of times, um, is the lost love line. The lost love line starts at the inner canthus and travels down, parallel to the grief line. The lost love line is not necessarily about romance. The lost love line is about a portion of your life that was a part of your identity, part of your, who you were as a person in your own mind. Does that make sense? That was lost. You know, maybe as a child, you love to dance or you love to do art. And for some reason, because of your cultural upbringing, you weren't, dancing was evil. It was a tool of the devil. And you were forbidden from ever dancing again. Because your, your culture or lost love line waiting to happen. 
Maybe there was a hobby that you loved to do and you met a man or you met a woman who just didn't approve of it in order to make her happy and to please her in that relationship. You stopped doing it. Lost love line waiting to happen. It starts at the inner campus and travels down. Okay? Lost love line waiting to happen. Okay? These are the ones that we want to get rid of. We need to get that joy back. We need to get that piece of their life operational to whatever degree they're, they're able to do that. Yes? We say get rid of your lines, change your life. Isn't it the opposite you change your life? The you, get rid of the emo- you get rid of the issue, the li- both change will, will change simultaneously, but you'll see this change first. So, because you're not talking about putting moisturizer. No. <laughs> no we're not. Although, I will tell you a story that, I, that Lillian told me. Um, when you see people with a lot of bone in their jaw, big strong jaw, these are natural warriors. These are people who gravitate to all kinds of athletic, physical activity. They have a lot of will, a lot of determination. They have the big Cro-Magnon roof, even more so, right? There was a, a client of Lillian's who was, uh, won a football scholarship, and he had this massive jaw, I mean massive, almost deformed, but he was a really good football player. And, um, and he went through high school. He'd been drafted into the college, you know, college scholarship. And as a graduation present from high school, his mom got in plastic surgery. He flunked out of school. Throw it off. He couldn't play anymore. Muscle memory still. What happened? The extra aggression, the extra assertion comes from the liver. Remember, liver likes to get angry. But people who have good, healthy liver energy know how to manage that anger. They direct it really well. Okay? People with sparse, with nice, thick eyebrows, they're good at anger. They, they take that energy and they use it to move forward. People who have sparse eyebrows like me, we can do anger, but we don't like it. I can do anger really well. I don't like it. I hate it, right? People with nice, heavy, they like to get angry, <laughs> okay? It's like, it's like that whole, Mr. McGee, don't get me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry, okay? You'll see this. I see this on a few of you. I got one or two of them. This is called a transformation line. This is somebody who at some point in their life went through a really deep, dark period. Could have been a day, could have been a year, could have been 10 years. And they came out of it different. They came out of it wiser. They learned something. They became more enlightened about some aspect of themselves or about life, the universe, and everything. I have one of them. Um, if you have a lot of them, you get what they call Buddha wings, which I think the Dalai Lama has. It's really cool, right? So if you see these, this is somebody, you can, you can paste this really, really well. You can walk up and say, I have an intuition about you. Say, so there was a time in your life that was really hard. It was really dark. You really had to struggle. And you went through it and you came out of it, looking back on it, learning something amazing, being completely transformed by it. See how you're nodding already? Because it's equally true for all of you. Right? However, when you see this line, it's actually true. You see that? I don't like cold reading because I don't like to lie. But I don't have to lie. I can tell them the truth and... If it's something they want to get rid of, I can help them do that. Is that useful? Very useful. Okay. Um, ears, and, and especially, this one I like a lot. I see this on a lot of you. This is called auditory intuition, AKA bullshit detector. <laughs> if you look at the person to the right or the person left, you'll see little lines. Some of you will have little lines right in front of your ears. These are usually people who grew up in an environment where they had to pay real close attention to the verbal cues of people around them. Auditory intuition. Auditory intuition. You got some. He's got some good ones. He's got some. I knew he had some. Right? This is somebody who knows when you're lying. You got some. Right? You see this? Don't try and lie. They'll catch you. Okay? And it usually that, that it, 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 evolves, it evolves as a form of hypervigilance. Many of the things that traumatize us growing up become the source of tremendous strengths and abilities later on, and this is one of them. The auditory intuition usually arises as a form of auditory hypervigilance, where we're in an environment that's dangerous. I grew up in a family where verbal abuse was like every minute. You never knew what you were going to get. And I had to constantly, constantly be on alert 
because anything I could say could set my dad off or start a, fi a fight or whatever. And so I've got freaking gills, right? <laughs> but even though it came from a place of trauma, for lack of a better word, it now serves me extremely well in the professions I'm in, right? Remember, everything we, we learned in the moment we experienced it probably sucked. But as we look back on it and we realize what we gained from that experience, we can keep that part and learn to let everything else go. And that's what we use the color game for. All of these things are nodes where holographic, the, 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 the neurology holographically imprints information and gives you access to it. Uh, in speed healing, we talked about the holographic memory theory that I use now in clinic, which works faster than traditional approaches. The human being, the human nervous system is a holographic information processing network. And once you understand how to tap into and unpack that hologram, and nothing in that model contradicts what we do in hypnosis, it just adds to it. Does that make sense? This is a way that we can start to unpack things that they don't even know is going on. They've forgotten about. And we can start a process of general clearing as well. So this is useful. Um, these here pay real close attention to, because I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if anybody who's working with terminal cancer, you're going to see those a lot. You're going to see those a lot. This is over-nurturing. These are people who are spending way too, time, take, too much time taking care of everybody else. And they're not getting anything back in return. They're giving more than they're getting and they're bitter about it, which is the bottom lines, bitterness. Okay? That goes on long enough. The neurology decides and it sees no way out. It decides to check out. So a lot of your terminal cancer patients, you'll see that. Okay? It, that doesn't mean they're going to get cancer. But almost always, there's no such thing as an emotionally healthy cancer patient. Okay? When, the, when they reach a point of hopelessness, which they're actually hopelessness does have a marker, it's not on this sheet, but there's a, what we call the hopelessness band. The hopelessness band, I see this from time to time and it just freaks me out, is like this little depression in the bone right across here. You see that, there's something that has traumatized them to the point where they've just given up. They've just given up. So if you see that and some of this, they're, they're living the life that's not good for them. Yeah? Do you look into a conflict with the ones around the mouth because those are a lot of the same ones you see in long-term smokers? Where, it, does that maybe change? Because I notice like some of it is the bitterness, the disappointment, the over-nurturing. But a lot of times that's, I see that in the people who have smoked. Have you ever run to see if they're, if they're over-nurturing? Right. Correlation is not causation, but why are they smoking? Right? If you're not, if you're, remember, smoking is a compensatory mechanism, right? There's something they're not getting. That's what that means. Everybody's getting everything and they're getting nothing. So the neurology is going to find a way to change that state. Smoking may be it, right? Bitterness. Bitterness. Ugh. Right here. Right? Now, it's below the lips. Now, somebody who's got a good sense of humor, you'll see a little line right here. That's a humor line. Here, you got one. <laughs> you got one. All right. Also, you see, this goes to some of the micro expressions. Fear has a, has a dimpling effect over the long term on the chin, so you see someone with a lot of dimples here, you've got someone who's holding in a lot of fear. It's a, these are lifestyle things, these are not micro expressions, you understand the difference? A micro expression happens in a fraction of a second when you're trying to suppress an emotion in that moment. This happens from a lifetime of expressions, it's generated by a specific set of emotional situations. Is this useful? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, what? They have a lot of fear that they're holding back. They're experiencing a lot of fear that they're not expressing in some way. Our president has it in spades. Fear. He was a bullied kid. You guys know that, right? Yes. Purpose lines means you found your niche. Purpose lines mean that you are actually on your path. The, these are good lines to have. 
And Lillian says we should have these by, by the time we're 50 at least. We may get them sooner. There's this thing in, in, the, in the lineage that I study called the golden path, which is the mission that you came here to fulfill. When you get, and I'm, I'm about, Lillian says I'm about as golden as it gets right now. But um, when, you, when you're on your path, things line up. You have almost unlimited energy to do those things. But most of our socialization, most of the, the, the expectations of the people and the, dominant, and the authority figures we grew up with tend to pull us off our path. But if there are things that you will do, you will pay to do, things that you love to do, that you would do any chance you got, chances are that's part of your golden path and you need to be doing that all the time and generating a living doing it. Okay? We have, she has whole workshops on golden path. I'll probably start offering them in the next couple of years as well. Yes? Is there a nice uh, high-speed hypnotic way to download this to where you can remember it without network <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that. I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but we'll come back to it. Yeah. What? Purpose lines. Purpose lines are here. They start at the outer, the outer alanesi, and they roll, they roll down this way. Now. Right at the corners of the mouth, you'll see, sometimes you'll see a little downturn. These are disappointment lines. Okay? So you can see how they kind of relate. You have over-nurturing, leads, leads to disappointment, leads to bitterness. See how it kind of flows? This all, by the way, is your intestines. Intestines. Large intestine, small intestine. So what are you looking at? Crohn's disease. IBS. Right? How many times have you unpacked IBS and found family shit going on? Right? You can look right at their face, right at their face, and say, how you, you know, again, you know, most you can't diagnose medically, but you can say, you have any bowel issues going on? You have, how do your intestines? So how did you know? By what aspect are you referring to? There's all kinds of lines in that area? No, this, in Chinese medicine, the holograph of the face, there's a, there's a face, there's an arm, there's legs. Intestines are here. So the large, the small intestine starts here and it wraps around this way. Lines. Vertical lines. If you see horizontal lines, that's, that we've got even deeper stuff going on. Like I said, this is a small piece of a very, very large system. Yes. Dimples are good luck. Yes. Dimples are good luck. Also, you have what we call money bags. Yes. See how, how nice and round the lower portion of her cheek is? That's called a money bag. That means somebody who's going to do well with money later in life. Sweet. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> right? Oops, I knocked somebody's water off. Um, he, he has his ears here. He has very large ears compared to the size of his head. So he actually uh, has potential for a long life. But he's also very close to his family. Family means a lot to him. True, not true. Right? See how the earlobe doesn't attach or d doesn't detach? That's somebody who's, they may hey, they have a strong connection to family. Uh, it's, it's like that family has to, now it may be a positive connection or a negative connection, right? He can take or leave parts, members of his family, right? <laughs> right? Okay. Let's see, who else can I pick on? Which what? There's a, it goes from here. There are your bottoms. Did you get, did you get, did Baltimore get you or what? You spend a lot of time worrying, don't you? Sometimes. Yeah. Do you have digestive issues? At times. Yeah. That line goes down into your spleen area, so that indicates you overthink and you tend to worry a lot. You're welcome. How'd I do? 60-40, you're there. Yeah. Well, overthinking and worrying a lot, kind of the same thing, aren't they? They are. Right? Yes? Me too. <laughs> this is the part I dread. This is where everybody wants me to come around and just point to you. You have a very open third eye. Very open, yes. Um, I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. A lot of joy, but there's some sadness there. You stress out too much. You spend a lot of time stressing on stuff. Um, well, you like to have your way, too, don't you? <laughs> She's, she's, got very, she's got a very strong, bony, extra bone in her jaw. That usually indicates somebody who's very hedonistic or a dictator. 
may not be bad. She's got money bags too. She's going to do well, right? You've got skepticism lines, right? And you've got some tears you need to finish shedding, sweetie. you got uber skepticism lines. You don't believe shit. <laughs> you need, you got a little bit of disempowerment going on, sweetie. You need to express yourself more. You got some unshed tears too. There's something you haven't finished grieving over, isn't there? Okay. Mm -hmm. you know. Just show them where the money bags were? Yep. Uh -huh. You're all going to go get cheek implants now, right? Now, here's the thing. Implants don't seem to affect things. But removing the bone does. Remember, your bones, in, in Chinese medicine, we have these different energies. We call, we call Ling, Jing, Qi, and Shen. Your, bone, your, your Jing is the most intrinsic of your energies. Okay? As you age, and depending on your lifestyle and how you use your life, you, you, you use your resources, you can burn through your jing faster or slower. Most of us die with, stu with huge amounts of jing that goes untapped. We have traits that we inherit from our father, or from our mother, and from our father that we can read on the face. And those are all talents we can access. And the people in this room, the skill sets you have, you, among all the people out there, are uniquely qualified to find them and open them up. But you have to know where to look. Does that make sense? Okay. Is this useful? Thank you. Like I said, if, if this is the scope, we got this, baby. I'm telling you. Okay. Um, money, oh, sorry. Went out on a, chased a squirrel there. Money is related to, there's two, er, there's two elements that relate to money in the face. The nose and the cheeks. A lot of the metal energy goes through the cheeks, but so does the earth. And the earth is your money. People, the, the, the length and shape of your nose determines how much money comes in and how fast it goes out. People who, <laughs> people who have a very thick bridge up here, they tend to take in a lot of money. And depending on how big their nostrils are, that will determine how fast it goes out. <laughs> if, you're, if you're super thin up here and the, the Liberty Bell down here, you better fucking marry someone rich. <laughs> uh, if you're removing bone, it's going to change you. Yes, but I would be very careful. I would be very careful. We don't really like to modify the face. In fact, if you change your emotional environment, the face will automatically change. Someone raise their hand. Yes. Uh, so some people can raise like one eyebrow. Uh -huh. There you go. So and some people can't. Right. right. Is that it's not really relevant here? All the, except for how it determines the wrinkling. Again, we're just looking at wrinkles. There's a whole map on moles, jaws, eyebrows, cheekbones. I mean, trust me. Even the shape of the head. People who have a if you divide the head this way, from the eyebrows up, mental. These are data seekers. You want to convince them or understand how they make decisions. If you try to pressure them to make a decision without giving them the right data and the time to think about it, they'll say no. Thank you very much. I'm going to ignore you now. Anyway, if you guys need to go, get the fuck out. If you want to stay, oh, we've got to do the drill. Uh, since it is the official start time, I'll open this loop. And then we'll do our... You guys ready for the drawing? Yeah. Okay. You guys know what you're, even you're, you're auditioning for? No. <laughs> okay. What's the prize? It's up as a $7,600 package. It's two live trainings on my 2017-2018 calendar. Whether they're on the calendar or not, if I add a training, it's available to you. It's any two of my full-length video training courses, $1,497 or less, and any of my five smaller video products priced at $97 or less. It's total package value of $7,600 and something dollars. Someone's going to walk out of here with one of them. Uh, I know. Uh, for those of you who are going to be hanging around, have some free time, I am doing a three-day training on sensuality enhancement. It's going to include this stuff. It's going to include the color game. Color, and color, by the way, color game is a real good way to start getting rid of some of these wrinkles. Okay? You have to unpack the reason behind the wrinkle and then ask the neurology what you want instead. Have it give a color and breathe the color through that area and just keep removing the layers until the wrinkle disappears. Okay? That's the level one intervention. You may wind up going to level two and three interventions real quick because usually these are more than one thing. You ready? All right. Limit one per person. So if you won before, you ain't winning again, bitches. Right. 
Let's see, where's my name? Hold on. All right. Uh, okay, let's see here. The amazing Karnak. Italian salami. Okay. Maria Bird, come on down. Congratulations. You. There you go. Hold on to that. Give me an email. Pick which courses you want, or if you want, uh, email me and we'll discuss what your goals are and we'll point out where to go for the trainings. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Wow. All right. I want to thank, I want to just take a moment to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart. Every year I come here and every year. I feel more warmth and more family from this, from this profession than any place else on the planet. And every year I think it can't get any better. And every, day, every year you show me a deeper level. And I want to just say thank you all. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave it up to you. You guys want to keep going? You want to? All right. If Rich, you got, you got to do bath and break? All right, bathroom break, come back in 10 minutes. Suspended needle. Okay, but what was it? It was the disempowerment one as well, right? Well, the disempowerment is here. Okay. Disempowerment starts here, and it comes out along this line. Okay. Like straight, like somebody took an X-Acto 